Live. Hi folks, and welcome to Open Analysis Live. So today we have a Twitch clip for you where we've taken a look at the new Emotet 64-bit version that just came out, and we're going to be using emulation to decrypt the encrypted strings in that sample. Now for emulation, we're gonna be using Dumpulator, which we've actually covered in a previous tutorial. If you want to go check that out, uh, I've linked it below. It's basically an emulation tool that helps speed up some reverse engineering tasks like decrypting strings or extracting configs. Very useful. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing today. And a reminder, if you like this kind of content, we have full recordings of all of our Twitch streams on our Patreon, along with in-depth reverse engineering tutorials. Go check it out if you like what you see. All right, without further ado, let's get into it. So in the code here, um, I guess maybe one thing we could do is we could set this up to uh, to be run with Dumpulator. That's how we did the other Emotet sample. Um, I'm not seeing, like if we look at our strings here, I'm seeing very few plain text strings, which is pretty normal for Emotet. Um, that's, that's common. And uh, I'm also, if we go back to our uh, entry here, tab it over and we'll just F5 it. Um, I'm also seeing something that we've seen before. Uh, actually, maybe we'll just make it this way and synchronize. So I'm also seeing something here that we've that we've become familiar with in the 32-bit um, version of Emotet, and that is that they are using some obfuscation. Uh, they're passing extra values to the functions. Um, that's kind of obfuscating the, the function call. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'll just grab a few of these. I don't know if they have a state machine. Ah, they do have a state machine. So they also are using their LLVM obfuscator on this sample. So we can probably throw that in here as well. Um, so they're also using, uh, using the same LLVM uh, control. as the 32-bit versions, and they are um, obscuring by passing constants are not used, right? So those are two things that we've observed. Here, I'll make this bigger. Those are two things that we've observed in uh, the 32-bit versions of Emotet. So if you weren't around for those streams, you can go back and check them out on Patreon. But those are not new to us, right? So it looks like this might actually be just kind of a 64-bit lift of the 32-bit uh, binary, which is making me kind of hopeful that maybe we can use some of the same tricks that we used for the 32-bit binary on uh, this binary. But we have something that's even more interesting here um, that we can go after. And that's that we know there's no plain text strings here, but we know there has to be plain text strings at some point. So that's leading us to believe there's probably gonna be some encrypted strings. So uh, everyone has a different way of doing this. Um, my way of doing it is to look through the data sections for things that look like encrypted blobs that have references in the code. And then if they uh, have references in the code, I will go and see what the what the code is actually doing and see if we can't decrypt um, decrypt them, see if they're like encrypted strings. So uh, again, if you guys are unfamiliar with this process, uh, you can check out our streams on Patreon. We did a stream on 32-bit Emotet where we use this exact same process to build the config extractor. So I'm gonna see if we can't uh, use that process here um, to, uh, to identify where the encrypted strings are and uh, and see if we can't decrypt them. So uh, first thing I'll do is I will unsynchronize. Uh, we don't need this synchronized for now, and it makes it a pain to scoot around the binary. Um, so we have a bunch of crap here up at the top of the text section. All right, that looks kind of interesting. Uh, these could be encrypted strings for sure. Uh, so that's not in a data section. That's just in the, in the text section here. Um, in fact, if we uh, undo this, that looks like a, an encrypted string to me, right? Um, what else we got here? We got some null bytes at the end. Let's undo this. Does that look like an encrypted string to you guys? All right, we got a reference here. Got two references here. Interesting. All right, let's find, um, let's name these so we can see them. So we'll name it um, txt blob one, and we'll name this. 
txt blob2. Uh, I usually use blob for chunks of data that I don't know what they are. I mean, these don't have to be encrypted strings. I don't know what they are yet. Um, maybe there's some artifact of the build process. I have no idea. But let's see where the reference. So I'll press X for X refs. And uh, let's now synchronize this or just F5 it, I guess we don't need to synchronize. Oh, whoops. Yeah, we should synchronize. Um, there we go, that makes it a little bit better. Okay, so now we can see uh, we are passing this blob one into this function here and we're passing two um, values. Uh, now again, you might, if you are just looking at Emotet for the first time, all of this will look confusing as heck, but since we looked at Emotet 32-bit, a lot of this looks very familiar to us. One of the obfuscation techniques they used in Emotet 32-bit is they would pass these constant values um, to function calls, which aren't really used in the function call or are marginally used in the function call. Um, some of them are used for the state machines, but a lot of them aren't. Um, uh, a lot of them aren't. So this looks like they're doing the same thing here. And that's also why I wrote um, obscuring function calls by passing constants. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, we can go and check out this function, but uh, it looks like that's probably what they're doing. And also what we want to do now is we know that this function is being passed this text blob. Let's check xrefs to this function. Oh, it's called a lot. Okay, so uh, we found something interesting, uh, right? This is like your normal triage for, for malware samples. Um, let's see what these function calls do. Oh, look, they're all being passed these strings from the text section. Well, not strings, blobs, right? Look, here, here. Okay, so this could be one of two things. It could either be some sort of API lookup or it could be encrypted strings. Uh, of course, we don't really know which one it is, but we do know that there's only one reason why you would have stuff in memory that looks like this, <laughs> right? That doesn't look like something. Uh, that looks like it's obfuscated somehow. So there's only one reason really why malware would have a whole bunch of stuff like this in memory, and it would be using one function for each one of these blobs uh, where the blobs are passed in. So we've already located something of interest, um, so I'm gonna name this, but I don't know exactly what it is, so I'm gonna call it maybe decrypt string. All right. So uh, we have to take a look at this function and see exactly what it does. And let's just remember the order of arguments, constant, pointer to, or address of blob, constant. All right, oh, look at that. Uh, the decompiler, run hash db first. Yeah, we can run hash db pretty soon, I think. Um, we could take a look at those imports, but I want to look at these strings first, right? Like let's start with the strings first and we'll deal with the imports later. So um, looking at this, uh, I don't see any while loops or, oh, no, I see a while loop. <laughs> I see a while loop right here. So anytime you have decryption, uh, oh, look at that. Anytime you have decryption, you're gonna be looking for loops, either for loops or while loops. Um, so at first I didn't see any, so I was skeptical, but now I see one. Um, so I'm thinking maybe there is some decryption going on here. And uh, also the compiler here has Good old XOR loop, yeah, exactly. That's what it looks like. <laughs> it looks like a simple, basic XOR loop. Um, however, uh, um, the if you guys notice something, the decompiler changed the calling, uh, the call definition, function definition, sorry, uh, when we decompiled it. Now I'm using the IDA's free decompiler. Anybody can download this version of IDA. It's the free version. Uh, so it's lacking many, many, many features. One of the features that's lacking is you can't decompile the whole binary up front, which is our trick for fixing all of the calling definitions. So if you guys have seen our other, um, our other streams where we basically use file, uh, produce file, and then produce C file, create C file. So uh, normally you would do that and that would force IDA to basically fix all the calling conventions as it decompiled because it's not just decompiling on demand. But of course, because we're using the free version with the cloud decompiler, you can't do that. So uh, we're gonna have to unfortunately do this the old school way 
which is we'll jump into these functions, so they force it to decompile, then we will come back to the function that we want to analyze. See, each time you jump into it, see it's, it's wildly changing the arguments. This happens also with the uh, obfuscated samples. Um, so you'll see like the, the arguments are wildly changing. If we F5 this again, you're gonna see them change again. See, they're, they're changing like crazy, right? Um, and if we pop back here, if we press F5 again, look, see, it's, they're, they're completely changing the number of arguments because each time you go into a function and decompile it, it forces Ida to update his references to the arguments. Um, and this is like a, you know, this is a, a real pain in the ass. 2,000 years later. So we found what we think is a decryption, uh, <laughs> is a decryption function. And uh, we already, we, we can see um, there's some interesting stuff in here. Uh, this right here sticks out to me. Um, obviously for decryption, you're mostly gonna be looking for any sort of XOR. So you can see there's an XOR here. Um, for more advanced uh, decryption functions, you're gonna see things, oh, Boris. You're gonna see things like, um, like XOR is uh, the final stage of like, you set up your key stream first and then you're doing the XOR. In this case, it looks like the XOR is pretty directly related to what's being passed in, um, what's being passed into this function. Now there's a bunch of crap like this, you know, it's like uh, value maybe undefined. Uh, I'm usually wary of relying on, um, I'm usually wary of relying on, uh, on the disas or on the decompiler when I see uh, orange values. It doesn't mean it's not accurate, it just means something's a little bit weird. Um, yeah, this is a little bit weird here too as well. Um, so what I might do is instead of trying to statically reverse engineer this, even though I think it wouldn't be too hard to figure out, um, but in instead of trying to statically reverse engineer it, what I might do is, uh, is just use the uh, dumpulator or use, um, uh, or use a debugger, because uh, that's going to be faster. I do want to kind of get in the in the hang of using Dumpulator more for this kind of stuff, because um, I think it saves a lot of time. Even though I can kind of guess at, uh, I can kind of guess at, at what's happening here, just because I've looked at some other Emetet stuff. Like I'm thinking possibly if we like XOR the first uh, D word here, you guys see this? Eight, and then what is eight? Is eight the loop count? If it is, yeah. <laughs> okay, instead of guessing, I'll just I'll just use dump you later. Okay, so let me start up my other VM here. We'll take a little, um, we'll take a mini dump, and then we'll start uh, messing around with dump you later. Just because it's fun and, you know, why not? Oh, wrong one, it's 64 bit. I'm so used to 32 bit, it's ridiculous. Open. Desktop, everything, Amitet, open, run until we get to the entry point, and take a mini dump, and we'll call, uh, there we go, mini dump, and we'll call it uh, Amitet, I guess, Amitet, what was this, B481, B481, one.dmp okay and let's see where i think that saves it into the home directory of the of the debugger um so it's program files and x64 debug release 64 debug emetet dump yeah there we go perfect close all this crap up exit Okay, uh, so we have our dump file here and we'll copy it down out of our VM here into our temp directory. New X quick, what's going on? Actually, you're just in time because we should give Duncan some credit here. Um, so if you guys like, um, if you guys enjoy Dumpulator and X64 debug, go support my man Duncan. He's the primary developer behind all of it and uh, now, if you don't like it, then, <laughs> then don't support him. New X quick. Um, actually, just for you, New X quick. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. So I think we're done with this VM here. Um, let's open up our uh, code here. So 
Okay, um, let's continue on here. So we have our dump in our uh, folder and our, uh, is it in our work folder here? Uh, yeah, just so you guys can see. So it's in our work folder uh, on our host. So I will uh, I will load it up here in, um, in our notebook. But what I'll do is I'll create a file path for it. Um, actually, you know what I'll do is I'll put some instructions of how to do this as well. Um, all right, there we go. So that should get you exactly what we have here. So now here, um, we can actually start using Manydump. Uh, let's just copy this stuff in here. So we have to load up our sample here. Um, the dump file. is going to be there we go and then you guys can just change that path to whatever you need on your local host when you run this uh we'll get rid of the tracing we don't need the tracing okay so if we run that there we go uh we've loaded up our mini dump into dumpulator here and now we're able to or we're um we're ready to start exploring. I think there's a way, is there a way to make it less verbose? I don't know if there is or not. Um, I guess we'll keep it verbose for right now. Um, anyway, if that's if that's bugging me later, I might come in and, uh, and try and quiet it down a little bit. Does it matter stopping at the DLL entry point or DLL reg server? We probably just want to stop at the DLL entry point um, and not let the uh, DLL entry point run because the entry point run entry point has a bit of code that might run as well. Um, when I'm taking a dump, I usually like to dump as soon as everything is is loaded, uh, so we don't pre-populate anything. Um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you're gonna have to play around with this a little bit. These instructions aren't going to be 100% repeatable for every sample. Uh, but usually what I like to do is uh, try and dump near the near the very beginning of the of the file before anything is running. Yes, uh, Paul Pepedo. <laughs> it is an interesting phrase. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is we probably want to see where this binary is loaded in our dump here. Uh, Let's see, so our binary is loaded here. So let's rebase Ida, All right? Let's rebase Ida here, um, edit, segments, rebase, and we'll rebase it to be at the same address. Oh, oops, what am I missing here? There we go. Okay. There we go, so we just rebased it so that all these addresses match up with the ones in our dump. Um, now we can probably have fun again if we want to. There it. Um, so let's go, um, actually let's go to the beginning here. Oh, oh, oh. Let's see where this is referenced. Okay, so this is where we reference our, um, it's where we reference the very first blob here. And uh, so what we can do is probably just run this uh, function from Dumpulator and see what it gives us. Now, I'm a little bit unsure about uh, these extra arguments. I don't know whether they're needed or not. Oh, it's an R9. Hmm. Uh, let's just pretend that they're not needed and let's just look at the return value here. Um, okay, so. Boogity! Hi, buddy. Hello. Oh, he's gone. Come on back. Come on. Oh, he doesn't want to come back. Oh, there you are. There you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, you're a good boy. You're a good boy. Alright, I'll, uh... <laughs> yeah, you're a good boy. Alright, I'll put it on if he decides to stay. But he's a little anxious, so he may not stay. <laughs> Solid Jungus, yeah. Um, okay, uh, so back on stream here, uh, on, uh, on topic here. Um, we're going to have to create a little template for our uh, function call. So let's call this um, function decrypt. And uh, we'll give it this address. And uh, we also want to find the address of that uh, first blob here. So let's go back. So this blob here. All right, and uh, I think that's probably all we need. Uh, again, I'm a little nervous about this extra um, R9 here, but it should be okay. Um, should be okay. Okay, so let's run this. Uh, I can't remember the exact code for calling a function. I have to copy it off Duncan here. Should also probably throw Duncan's banner back up. Uh, where does he call? There we go. All right, so we're gonna call this function and we're gonna pass it these values here, which I think you probably don't need. If it's anything like the original emetet, you won't actually need these, um, but let's pass them anyway. And blob one is going to be the second argument here. And then we're gonna have this value here. Good. Okay, all right. Um, and I think that's probably it, right? So we have constant, address, constant, and then something. Uh, what was the Xurex 9695E? Uh, this guy right here. So these are constants. I'm not exactly sure what they're used for. So if we look here, um, it looks like these guys uh, are not not really used in the function. So this is a trick I mentioned earlier in the stream that Emetet 32-bit was using, where they would pass the, um, extra constants uh, to a function. You can see here, uh, you know, they're they're moving them into uh, onto the stack, but it's not really doing anything um, with this uh, when you uh, you know like they're not really being used. So likely they're just there to, you could probably just change them to anything you want because they're not actually referenced. They're just there to obfuscate the function call. Uh, so we can't really see what it is. Okay, so um, let's run this. It actually emulated, which is very nice. Um, we get a return value. Um, okay, so uh, we do see we have a result here and the emulation didn't, uh, didn't explode, which is good. So let's do results. Uh, and let's take a look at the results here. So we'll print out a hex value of it. All right, so it looks like uh, 1FDF. Uh, 1FDF, yeah. So we're somewhere up in here. Um, so maybe it's they've allocated some space or something. Uh, so let's take a look at what's in there. I'll just print it out as a hex string. Uh, so we'll just do dp dot read and let's just read a couple bytes out of it. I don't know how many bytes we really need to read. Um, maybe a hundred bytes out of it. Ah, okay, sweet. So um, you guys see something interesting here? Percent s percent s dot e x e null 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 null. Right? So uh, what is this? Well, it's a wide string, right? So we have found a decrypt function. This is indeed uh, decryption. All right. 
and uh, we now have a way to decrypt strings. So we can probably pass every single one of those uh, those strings from the beginning of the text section into our dumpulator now, and we should be able right, let's unlink this right now. Uh, so we can probably pass all of these guys in to uh, the dumpulator, and hopefully we will be able to decrypt all these strings. Um, there it is. Okay. So uh, I guess there's no uh, length that comes back to the string, uh, which is kind of too bad. So we can split it on the null byte, and let's just do that now. Um, so I think probably what we'll do is we'll create a little uh, uh, a, um, a little decryption function with dumpulator that we can reuse, and then um, yeah, we'll create a a decryption function, and then we'll try a couple more of these strings. Okay, um, so we have to do it like this, I think. Def decrypt string, and we're gonna have a blob. Or I guess it should be. And all this can be tabbed in. Right, and our result here is going to be the decrypted string. Um, we just have to change this to be what we pass in. So our result is going to be the decrypted string, and uh, we don't need to print that out necessarily. Um, yeah, we just need to read a bunch of bytes out, and let's assume strings aren't going to be more than a hundred bytes long. It could we could be wrong about that. This is a little sloppy because um, we don't know the actual string length, but. Um, but yeah, uh, instead of printing it, let's just read it in. Uh, so this will be the, or p text, I guess. All right, and then we have to split it off. So uh, out is p text string dot split on the first double null. Okay, and we want to take the very first part of that, and then we also want to uh, remove all the null bytes as well, right? So we want to replace uh, with nothing. All right, and then we'll just return node. So let's test this out now. Um, Decrypt string. Blob one. All right, so uh, it's a byte array. We want to get it out of a byte array. Uh, so let's figure that out as well. You can just do bytes on top of it. Is it decode? Oh, yeah, it's decode, sorry. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, it's decode. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, and we probably want to also, I wish we could silence this, but it's not the end of the world. I know there was like a flag that we were using for old dumpulator. Maybe I'll try and find it actually. It's probably worth finding it. Do we have a dumpulator for that? Uh, yeah, we use dump later for that. Uh, quiet equals true. I knew there's a flag for it. Yeah, there we go. Good thing we have all these. Oops. Uh oh. What did I change? I didn't change anything. Discard. Okay. So let's throw our uh, quiet equals true into here. There we go. Okay. And if we run it like this, hey, all right, sweet. 
So now we have our uh, string decryption. Uh, that was pretty fast. I mean, it might have been faster to um, might have been faster to just do this statically in Ida. I don't know, but I think it's kind of fun to try this uh, try this dumpy later stuff and see if we can't get it to to speed up our workflow a little bit. Uh, where are the Drupal notes? Bang research. Uh, the, there we go. Um, yeah, and then for each note in the research, um, where they are here, copy link. So the way it works is for each note here in our blog, uh, there's a little view on GitHub. You can click on it, and then you have the original uh, Jupyter Notebook, which you can download and run yourself if you want. So that's the way these are set up. Okay, um, there we go. So we have a dec decryption function. Um, let's decrypt the rest of these strings. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that and I hope it's useful for you. If you wanna check out our notes, I've linked those below. There are Jupyter notebooks that you can download uh, from our blog and use them, run them, add code, change code, however you see fit. And of course, big shill for our Patreon. Go check it out if you like this kind of stuff. See you next time. And remember, keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware. Stay curious.